personally that uh, I could find staff in Rutland and they were willing to come to work, but once they realized we were in Woodstock, then they would pull their application. Um, so I did some research. Um, I thought maybe, you know, a group of businesses could get together and um, hire a bus or something. So um, looked at different options, called uh, several uh, transportation companies in Vermont in the area. And uh, to make a long story short, I found out about a program that is sponsored by the state of Vermont and is put up by uh, the rental company Enterprise, and it's called Vanpool. And pretty much this, it's a very simple system. Um, a group of employees gets together and generally it is organized by their company. Um, and they, the company rents a, a, a van. It's a, either a seven person van or a 14 person van. And they just commute to work together. Um, so they, the only challenge is to have similar schedule and a similar route. Um, and the state of Vermont sponsors that for various reasons that they have to do that, um, green and, you know, helping people find jobs, et cetera. They sponsor up to $1,400 um, a month for their rental for their first six months of the program. And after the first six months, they sponsor $700 um, a month. Now, these numbers don't speak until unless you know how much it actually costs to rent a van. So um, I spoke with the gentleman who's in uh, charge of coordinating these rentals in um, Vermont, Connecticut, and New York. He covers that uh, tri-state area. And it's actually not very expensive. The cost, including Roadside assistance, assistance, preventative maintenance, physical liability, phys um, physical and liability insurance, which was my concern, and also they throw in a guaranteed ride home program, which I hadn't thought about, and they also quote you the price with fuel, so it's an all inclusive price, is it about sixteen hundred dollars a month. If you were to have a van that goes back and forth to Rutland, for example, or back and forth to White River, I asked for the two destinations because they're sort of alongside the Route 4 corridor and they're different distances. So I figured it might be a very different price, but actually the pricing for the rental itself is the same. It's just a fuel estimate that is different. Um, so I thought that was super interesting. I just thought that all the businesses in Woodstock should know. Um, and my next step was going to be to reach out to most of the businesses in Woodstock to kind of find out where the staff lives and things like that. But then I realized this was not, it would be more effective if it were done by um, the EDC, for example, versus a private individual like myself, just reaching out to, to businesses. Um, so there's a couple um, nice things also that it, it's, it seems to be a very well-oiled machine, that program that they have. Uh, Darn Tough uh, Socks does it. Ethan Allen does it. They're working with Ben and Jerry's to do it. I spoke with the person at the state level who's in charge of that, and he would be very excited to have a Vermont community do that. They don't have that yet, but they would really like to have that off the ground. And so they do things like, for example, for gas, they provide the employees with a, it's like a credit card that is refilled and it's factored into the price and they just adjust it a little bit um, if, you know, if there's a, a, a variation. Um, they, what they do is they- um, Isabel, sorry, yeah. you interrupt. You should just explain. I don't think you mentioned because it was that it, right. the employees drive the car. Yeah, it's a rental. The employees drive the car. So let's say you have um, you have 10 employees that are on the same route. They go from point A to Woodstock and back and they have similar schedules. Uh, what the what enterprise does is they take they encourage as many people as possible to be uh, listed as drivers for that van because they'll have you know some people will be it'll be their day off or somebody can't make it or whatever they run everybody's driver's license they do all the background checks that need to be so the drivers are listed on that rental and they need to figure out amongst themselves who's going to drive what day um, the drivers also are allowed to use the van for their personal 
usage up to 10% of the mileage. So when they, when they actually quote you the mileage, let's say it's, I don't know, 100 miles a day, they're going to add 10%. They're just automatically throwing 10% extra for the employees to use for their private usage. They need to pick up a kid, whatever. They want to go out for pizza with their spouse. They're allowed to do that. It is covered within 10%. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. So they also have something really nice is guaranteed ride home program. If an employee is sick at, uh, on the job or their kid needs to be picked up from school, they can't get on that van pool up to four times a year. The state of Vermont will pay for that employee to be brought back home up to a $70 Right, so they'll pay a tax or whatever. I, I don't have the details, but we can ask about that. <clears throat> and um, and yeah, I think that covers it. When when it's time to get an oil change, the employees get a notification uh, where to go, what day to go, uh, drop off the van. Um, and there's also you know preventative maintenance. And of course, if the van something's wrong with it, they they'll change it. It's a rental, so that's how it works. Um, so I thought it was pretty exciting and I thought it would make sense if the EDC could um, take over the organization of that, the coordination, spreading the word um, and getting people on board to get organized. Uh, and, Mika, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, Mika's got a question, go ahead. Is there a minimum number of people in order to have that price be $1,600 a month? So there is no minimum, but they recommend that you have at least four people to make it financially viable. But again, it's a rental. Um, so you rent and it's a, they quoted us for a seven. Uh, I think they can't go below seven people in order to qualify for that program, but it's gonna be a seven person van or a 14 person, was it 14 or 16, 14 or 16 person van. But we can do whatever we want. Um, he just said, you know, it's really viable for and more. The, the cost mm -hmm. per month, if, if you know, the, the, the concept that Isabel and I were briefly talking about and that enterprises where the state talks about is that the state subsidizes it almost all of the costs for the first six months and say 45% of the cost after that. And then the employees, the employers pay a piece of it. I thought that the EDC could fund a piece of it and the employees pay a piece, but, but what they end up paying is, you know, a dollar or two a day, a couple of two, three dollars a day, something that's quite affordable. And yeah, go ahead. So, so, so the gentleman at the state of Vermont, he said, sure, you could, you know, you could pay for everything you meaning the employer and or the community, but they found that there is more buy-in if the employees need to pay uh, at least a little bit. Yeah. And in the game, it. they take it seriously. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, I, have, so, um, I have a lot of uh, contacts through my work at Darn Tough. I'd be happy to figure out who organizes that there and get some so, information about well, the if you can get their feedback on how happy they are, yeah. um, I have the contacts of the two people that we need. I have the person who coordinates that with enterprise and he knows that I'm talking to you about this today and that if this is a go, um, you know, we were thinking of having a meeting that would be for all the Woodstock businesses and he would be present to answer any questions I haven't thought of asking him and maybe giving us, you know, some guidance on, how to approach that, how to get organized, because the challenge we're going to have is that we're a bunch of different businesses. Um, I think the good thing is that I sort of, and it just this is just a guess, but I kind of think that we pretty much have all the same schedules. I can see two kinds of schedules, people coming into hotels and retail every morning and leaving early, you know, late afternoon. So it would be like 10 to five or something to figure out where, you know, we can agree. And then you'd have the, the later, you know, the, 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 the later people like, like restaurants, for example, if that interests them, if that's of interest to them to have, I don't know, a three to 11, I have no idea, but like a different, like a staggered um, kind of, it, it, and we would need two vans. And also we need to, uh, our, our main um, 
challenge, but it's not, it's just a question of, I guess, putting a survey together and asking people where their staff is, is to figure out which routes we want to have. And we can have more than one if it works well, you know. I don't know if there's somebody today on the call from the Woodstock Inn that we're going to try to be there because they're interested in joining that. And if we could have a big employer like the Woodstock Inn or somebody else to get that started, it would give us already a basis, but it's not absolutely necessary, but I know that they were interested. I thought they used to run a van. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, John. Go ahead. I, I thought they ran a van, uh, not one. Uh, uh, I don't know. I had heard once upon a time that the inn ran a van from here to Rutland to help with employees. Um, I feel like I heard that back when Courtney was there. Beth, do you remember that? Beth, go ahead. Um, no, I, I no. don't remember. Okay. But Beth, you wanted to make a comment? I just have a question for Isabel. Will the state pay for, uh, will the $1,600, if you ran two vans, would they cover the six? Two times that's a that. good question. I, I would assume that it's per van, per rental, but it's a good question. We could ask them that. Um, I, I don't see why not, um, but yeah. Larry? Uh, I, I think this sounds great. Um, it, it sounds like there's gonna be an ongoing organizational need. Is that yes. something that we would fund or how did you think that would work? Um, I, I think we might need one person, I thought, at least it should be under the 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 onus of the of the of the of the EDC. Um, somebody needs to coordinate that. Um, and actually, we could ask the gentleman at Enterprise how he sees that. He was happy to interface with the employees directly once we had, you know, our sort of organizational chart of how we want things to be done. He was fine, um, you know. Have, collecting dues from each of the employees or whatever. But to get this started, we do need um, a point person or a point or, or a group of point people. Why don't I ask, uh, and, and Isabel, just to confirm, or if you know the answer that, I mean, it costs almost nothing for the first six months. It's probably, you know, between the EDC and the employers and the employees, it's gonna cost, uh, you know, a hundred dollars a month. <laughs> Yeah. something or 150 to 200 dollars a month for six months so is there can and so it's sort of set up to be a perfect pilot test mm -hmm. we could go through it and if for some reason it's we decide after six months that it's not worth right. the extra thing we could stop right right so i mean it seems like it's a month to month commitment from enterprise oh wow okay so is there anyone for let me ask before i ask the people in the community is there anyone on the EDC who'd be interested in, in pushing this further? And maybe Isabel, if you'd continue to work on it, but having someone from the EDC side by side and basically coming back next month, ideally next month and, and having investigated these open questions and proposing and working out the kind of funding. And that includes probably getting input from from businesses to understand that. That's I think the main- a, a main. I think that's the, ur that's the urgency that we have right now. Is right. there any anyone on the EDC who's interested in in picking that up? Before we don't all raise it. No, not all at once. Uh, is there anyone else on the call? I mean, we can. I mean, I I, I could help out. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I was. I don't know all the business owners, but um, I can figure it out. Okay. All right. That's great, Devin. Why don't you? Um, I mean, between you and Isabel, and then with support, if the chamber would like to participate, obviously for their members, you could obviously be happy to. welcome to. And Sally has actually put together partially a, a list of local businesses for some of the other working groups. Um, Perfect. So um, I think this sits outside of the working groups in per se. It doesn't quite fit in anywhere, and I think it's just a one-off initiative. But uh, I think it's a really creative idea. So. If you have a working group that is focusing on businesses and they have a, a mailing list, that's what we really need. Yeah, we're putting that together. Well, Sally, unless Sally wants to jump in, I think we're putting that together, but we don't have, a, I mean, Beth has some and, you know, many, Beth has the best list, but right. um, Sally, go ahead. Yeah, I don't, we have a list, but we've been, we haven't been focusing on hospitality. And most of the list is on the downtown businesses. So, yeah. well, that that's great too. I was seeing yeah. that you know a company like Nutty Life is is hiring. I was think, thinking right. of them. You know, uh, these types of little companies we, they they tend to sort of get forgotten. But maybe that's really the push that they need is having you know somebody from Lebanon 
be, be able to come in and, and work for them thanks to that program? Well, it, it does sort of half fit into the attracting new businesses working group. So we could yeah. loosely, Devin, you should, you should do coordinate it with Isabel, okay. if that's yeah. okay with the two of you. Yep. Yeah. That'd be great. Right. Uh, sorry, Elizabeth. Yeah. And uh, you might've mentioned this, Isabel, D who own, who holds the liability for. for it's the covered by the insurance uh, that enterprise has. So it's, it's, covered by the whole package and it's the price is quoted in that so we don't have to worry about that including for their private um, um, drives if they use them mm -hmm. and are there flexible uses beyond just em employee transportation so i haven't asked that question that's a good question um what what, 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 what were you what thinking, were you thinking yeah <laughs> well just i've uh, one thing that i've been hearing from um the the for, from an after school programming perspective from an educational perspective is that parents have parents feel challenged by transportation after school to and from different after school programs so they have to mostly it's moms have to leave work early to get kit pick up kids and drop them off at after school programs and then go back to work for a couple hours and then come back to pick them up again so i think there's just a, i was just kind of thinking through that lens so, so I'm going to just jump in and say that the Woodstock Area Relief Fund actually just funded somebody who is high, who is getting a van to do exactly that. Oh, good. Okay. We'll pick up. So there is another another initiative that's going on right now. Good. It would be worth just checking, though, uh, um, Isabel and Devin, if if it's easy to check, you know, along right, with other questions right. you're asking, to ask Elizabeth's question and see what. Right. Absolutely. So we have the information. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I'll be working with Devin, and hopefully we can set up a business meeting, info meeting, fairly soon. Right, Devin? Sounds good to me. Okay, great. I'll be in touch. Okay, great. Nice. Devin, uh, Joe. Well, the only question I, I I like it. I think it's a great idea. I'm just wondering what the job market like is in Rutland. Is that are we assuming? I mean, everybody's sort of help. Are we assuming that there are people available in Rutland? That would be willing to get a job in Woodstock. Well, that's the big unknown, you know. Are people going to go want to go back to work? Mm. I know. Okay, just curious. I, I'm just curious if that was something that you looked into. Well, I. I I would love to have someone from the EDC maybe look into um, the pools where we where businesses could go and hire from. I mean, the other way is to just hire um, everywhere that we can think of: um, Springfield, Claremont, Lebanon, Rutland, right. um, and um, there's also. I think we need to get this started fairly quickly because we also need to market to all these towns that the town of Woodstock in one fashion or another is sponsoring transportation to go work in Woodstock. Um, so if somebody has ideas to how to, you know, market that, um, that'd be great. Mika, did you want to add something? Yeah, I guess I just, uh, I would encourage the communication to go out in as many ways as possible that that this initiative is happening because there might be there might be pools of employers that you know I don't I'm thinking farm like farm workers for instance you know it, it might not necessarily just be lodging and retail mm -hmm. so I would hate for that communication to go out to sort of standard brick and mortar and then perhaps there's a whole pool of employers that don't even know that this is happening and, and might need help with employee. Uh, farm and lawn care come to mind. What was that? Farm and lawn care. Exactly. You know, I'm thinking it's we're heading into a garden season. I know a lot of, I've seen a lot of property management companies yeah. for help and farmers and things like that. So. Well, also our, we have three quote unquote nursery homes, right? Our long-term facilities. Mm -hmm. These two are uh, labor intensive, have a lot of staff and they are always struggling to find staff. So I was thinking we should reach out to them as well. Absolutely. I think it's, it's such a great idea. Well done. Okay. Devin. Um, I guess I, I have two questions. The first is, does the state of Vermont care if the van is say coming from out of state so if it is coming from claremont or lebanon uh does that present a problem with the state's funding of it we should ask them 
That's okay, a good the, question. Um, we can look at that. And then the other was um, not a question, but an idea. I think that state unemployment offices, both in, in New Hampshire and Vermont, um, could be a way of getting the word out to potential employees who are looking for work. Okay. Okay. Yeah, marketing is something we need to we need to think about how, how to launch this program. So, okay. All right, that's great. Isabel, thank you for doing this. That's terrific. Um, thank you for your time. I thought only the EDC had good ideas, but apparently <laughs> we don't have a... We don't. It's a little bit facetious. Okay, good. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, um, let me just put up the agenda. Um, sorry. And we'll move on. Okay, um, now I just thought we would just briefly uh, go through the different working groups and uh, I've sort of reorganized these into just a list of the six. They previously was marketing, housing, and then business environment, which had four pieces to it. It seems sort of silly. So I've just listed all the six. Um, and we'll just go in the order here, if that's okay. Um, uh, marketing, does anyone from the marketing working group wanna give an update, Patrick? Go ahead. Uh, okay, so we've, we've hired a person now to replace Katie. Uh, her name is uh, Jennifer Schnitzky. Uh, she's been working with Jennifer uh, from the end, who's a part of our committee, uh, being trained uh, on the different uh, aspects of, of software and stuff that we're using. She's about two thirds of the way through that training. Uh, the email that went out today, she had sent out. Uh, so she's well on her way to, uh, uh, to taking over the, the position uh, from Katie. So uh, that's kind of where we are with that. And then we're getting together uh, to start uh, on the concepts of what we're going to do for marketing Woodstock uh, in the future in the next week or so. So all is moving well with marketing. Okay. I just want to remind uh, the three of you, where did Beth get still here? Oh, Beth is there. Sorry. Um, the three of you that are on the marketing group, you, Beth and Sally, that Jeff Kahn raised his hand to join the group, uh, it is the group's responsibility to pick people. And I unfortunately, for those of you that don't remember and didn't realize that, so I told Jeff in one of these public meetings, of course you can join the group. I, I then un, untold him that, but <laughs> said that the group was, you know, hopefully going to select him. So would you either select him or reject him? But um, the next meeting, uh, which I think is going to be next week, we're 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 going to making that decision. Okay, good. And hope, uh, yeah, I would. I it's your decision, but I personally hope you select him. <laughs> but it's up to you. You don't have to. You're not. It's your your own committee. So okay. Save you, John. Is that what you're saying? I'm so yes, please. <laughs> well, it's up to you. Do what you think is best. So. Okay. Um, housing. The the. Reform. We're now slowly starting to reform the housing group. Uh, Devin has uh, agreed to join. I'm going to be part of. That's the one working group that I'm going to be part of. Um, Jill Davies uh, is asked to join, um, and uh, we're looking for other people who would like to. We have some suggestions. Um, in the meantime, as we recruit additional folks for that working group. Um, we've been approached by the Woodstock Community Trust to brainstorm about ideas for housing. So for those of you who don't recall, the Woodstock Community Trust has been reformed, I guess, around housing. And uh, they have now just completed their third single family home purchase. They, their model is they raised a chunk of philanthropic money. They use that to buy the first house. They put in you know, robust renovations to make the house low maintenance and, and enduring, and then sell it to someone who, you know, a working family uh, who, who can afford, you know, who, who have income and can afford to rent, I mean, to own, but can't afford the prices in Woodstock. And so they put in a subsidy. And I think if I'm, I'm speaking out of school, if anyone else knows, but I think uh, uh, perhaps that, um, you know, the price, if the home might be uh, $300,000 and they put $100,000 into it. And so it's cost them 400 and they sell it for 260. And so it's pretty hard to get a nice home in Woodstock that's enduring and, you know, strong and doesn't need a lot of repairs for 260. And then they take that 260 and then they do it again. And they've done that now three times. And um, what they're looking at 
is, to talk to us about is the possibility of putting together a joint group that might involve some private investors, some philanthropy that they could provide, and some funding from the EDC to allow this to grow and to, you know, and so forth. And it might be in the form of a loan that we would back th their borrowing, which would be sort of a six to eight month loan that they would then pay back when they sold the house. Or it might be in the, uh, we don't know. I mean, there's no decision. We haven't even begun to brainstorm about it yet, but that's the kind of the concept. And I think it fits into the housing group. We don't know whether that's a good use of our funds or a bad use of our funds. Um, compared to other options, because we don't know what our other options are, like building accessory apartments or, I mean, incenting accessory apartments or other things. So just FYI, that's uh, a meeting that we're trying to set up. It should happen before our next EDC meeting, and uh, as, in, as well as hope, hopefully recruiting a couple of other people to kind of get going on housing. So let me just pause for a minute. Any comments on either marketing or housing? I should just leave time for discussion here. Larry and then Mika. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, I think it was Bill Corson, who's on, I think, was mentioning something about uh, some developers looking at housing in right on the Bridgewater Woodstock line. I was wondering if there's any update on that. Bill, go ahead. If you have, I don't have an update. I haven't spoken. To them. Yeah, I don't have too much of an update, Larry. Um, my contact in New Jersey indicated that his, the owners of the property are not really interested in doing that, at least not anytime soon, which is very disappointing. Uh, I haven't had a follow-up phone call with him, Mark Hewitt, to see if there's any possibility of it being done down the road. But I do know it won't be anytime soon if they do it. So it's not something that we can get excited about right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mika? Um, I, I'm peripherally involved with that group uh, with the Woodstock Community Trust. So I would be happy to join join that effort, you know, in the merging of those two between the EDC and that group. Um, and then I also just was adding just a slight clarification or maybe just some added content in case anybody's interested. One of the, one of the best things about that program is that not only do they do the renovations on the house so that you're buying into a house that doesn't necessarily, you know, need another 260 in, in reno, but on top of that, what they really do is they provide the down payment because um, that is often the biggest hurdle uh, in affordable housing. It's, it's the, you know, if you have 30, 40, 50, 60 grand to put down on a house, then sure, you can have this mortgage payment that is perhaps equivalent to a rent in the area. But if you don't have that large chunk, then um, <clears throat> often what the barrier is. So that's, I think, one of the coolest things about the program is that it provides that down payment. And, and the house does in, if you want to call it affordable, it, it lives in affordable housing in perpetuity. So um, there is a small amount of money that could be, could be regained. I, I don't think that, and I, I get a little foggy here, but uh, if you were to decide that that house isn't for you anymore and you want to go and buy a regular house on the regular market and you sell that house, um, you do get some amount, I think, of your equity back. It, it's not the way it would be if you were buying a, a market value house. Um, so, you know, the program isn't for everyone, but it's a really, really wonderful program that's, uh, that if we could, you know, really make it a little bit more robust, I think it has a lot of potential. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Mika. And I'll include you. We're just starting to schedule that meeting now, so I'll just send out any, I'll include you in that. So. Yeah, great. Thank you. Patrick and then Elizabeth. Mika, is it, am I right in saying that too, when the house is sold, it needs to be sold to somebody again who needs help? Yeah, again, it lives in, in that program in perpetuity, right? And not everybody, so one, you need to qualify for that program um, and you need to jump through a certain amount of hoops to get into it, nothing crazy, but you know, you, um, there, are, there are programs that you need to go through. Right. And, uh, so the person selling it's not selling it to just anybody. They're selling no, to and, and not not just anybody would want it, right? Because more often than not, somebody that's buying a house would want to know that the appreciation that they're going to get a hundred percent of their equity out, yeah. and that it could appreciate at the same level that every other house appreciates at. And and these houses are slightly different. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to make sure that. Yeah, it's a good question. 
Uh, so I was just wondering, I think, John, what I heard you describing was something similar to like a revolving loan fund. And oh, you're on mute. Come on, John, you're the pandemic and you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Um, sorry, at one point, um, that was just my idea. At one point, I had a, a, a 30 second conversation with, with someone from WCT, I think it was Jill, who, saying, she was saying that we, they can afford to keep going, but what they need is just the capital for a short time to buy the house. And so, you know, it, it actually wouldn't, you know, with interest rates at, you know, 1.9%, it would cost us almost nothing to lend them money for six months if we thought it was a good credit risk, which obviously it's backed up by a house. So, you know, so I, that's, but that's, it was literally a 30 second conversation. That's why we're having this meeting to explore the various ways at which WCT thinks they can expand housing supply. And it sounded as if capital, short term capital might be a bit of a constraint and we might be able to have that. So that's yeah. all. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea. And I was wondering if, if, if we, if you were to explore something like a revolving loan fund, which is essentially, you know, access to a flexible source of capital right. that can provide those bridge amounts, I'm wondering if we want to think a little bit bigger than just housing and have an economic development commission revolving loan fund that, as we get further into some of this downtown rejuvenation and attracting new business, if there's going to be other capital needs in which you know, we could start to make it attractive to to renovate or to upgrade because there's access to this more flexible source of capital. So it could be it could actually be a fund to, su to support all of EDC's priorities. No question. And in fact, when we um, I've just been waiting for us to generate proposals that instead of being, you know, seven thousand dollars a year are $650,000 this year and then nothing for the next nine years. And that's exactly when, so we, as these, and I think our working groups are 60% or 70% of the ideas that come out of them are going to be of that financial nature, which will require exactly what you're describing. So I think we should wait for the ideas before, because they'll help to define the characteristics of the fund but you're right, it could apply to housing, it could apply to, to all the things you mentioned. And that's where I'd like to see the EDC get to, but we need, I don't think we should set up the fund before we have the, the demand for the funds, right? Yeah, but that's-, that's, that's I that's, completely agree. I was just thinking not, yeah. to, not to limit, make the structure limited. No, it's a, very, it's a very good point. And actually we should be careful not to do that, not to jump to the first thing that happens, but think about that we might have, three or four diverse needs. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now that's, yeah, I think that's gonna be a major a major effort in the next couple of years is to set something like that up. That's, a, yeah, that's great. Very good. Um, uh, Bill Corson has moved on my screen. There you are, Bill. Yeah, hi, I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question, but what always concerns me about the downtown area is all the dark apartments that are above the retail stores. You go around at night and there's no housing, there's no, nothing going on up there. It's just dark. It just seems like they could be made into apartments for people to live and those people that, that need housing and, um, you know, that would want to work in a restaurant or a retail store during the day would be able to stay there. What's, what are the barriers from us preventing us from, from achieving that? So let me just use that to jump. I'm just going to skip over Larry, the policy group for one minute and just go to the fourth one, which is the downtown rejuvenation. Yeah, and sorry, I didn't mean to rush you. I just, just no, 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 no. It's a good segue me. to that. And if there's anyone else on that group, I'm not on it. If there's anyone on it, you can add to what I'm saying. But one of the things that that group is looking at, uh, and I don't think they've made a lot of progress, Bill, but they will be looking at this, is to inventory and then brainstorm about the use of underutilized space in the village. Uh, and, that, and the second floor, the second floors along Central Street and Elm Street uh, are a prime examples of that. I know from personal experience that it is not economic to do exactly that conversion. Um, a group of us looked at buying some space on the second floor of Elm Street and converting it into five apartments. And you can't make the numbers work without some kind of incentive. Um, that doesn't mean the EDC should provide one, but it does mean that investors will not do it without under the current economics. And that's why it's not getting done. Uh, yes. However, the number, at least in our case, when we looked at it, the numbers were not unaffordable. 
And so it, I'm hoping that that group will, and that, that the housing group will look at that and see what it, you know, and bring it, bring a plan that would say to make this happen, here's what it would cost. And does, is the benefit worth the cost? And I think it might very well be. It would be a beautiful thing just to see those spaces occupied and lit up at night with people's uh, living there. This beautiful, it looks so dark and like a ghost town at night without people there. Uh, I agree completely. I, I yeah. think that, that, I agree completely. I think that's okay. both the housing slash downtown rejuvenation. The downtown rejuvenation is gonna look at yeah. all of the underutilized spaces. Um, not just suitable for housing. They're going to try to figure out right. what the empty spaces are, storefronts, houses, park, potential parking areas, and trying to figure out what, what it would take to make them more, generate more value. So Great. thank you. For the is there answer. anyone else on the rejuvenation group that wants to add to what I've said? I, uh, Joe? Well, um, initially the group looked at a, uh, the possibility of getting into the downtown designation program with the state and after a few meetings um, it, it, the consensus was because we already have a village center designation with a lot of advantages that have not been utilized yet that uh, it probably wouldn't be worthwhile uh, pursuing that downtown um, designation program. Um, so what what, I, what we were taking is changing direction and focusing more on the village center designation that has a lot of programs that are available that really been underutilized. There's you know there's grant for facade update. There are there are tax credits for what Bill was talking about, and you also, John, uh, about converting second floors to apartments. And there are uh, numerous tax credits for just that. If you, for example, install new plumbing and um, sprinkler systems, even elevators, um, there, there's, there's stuff available. So uh, we're gonna kind of, what I thought would be a good idea is just really um, look at every one of those individual um, opportunities and just try to probably, well, that might be premature, but my original thought was, you know, match it up with an existing property, you know, that this one specific part of that opportunity in the village center designate would apply to that building. And, I, and then from there on, you know, get into it with the housing or um, maybe layers group and see how that could be applicable, how those different um, advantages could be used. So that's that's kind of where we are now. Yeah, I think marketing, yeah, marketing village designation is a great is a great next step. So and I, I was going to get to that. Good. Thank you for that update. I'll go back uh, to policy then. Larry, do you want to? Give us a quick update. Um, yeah. Um, well, first of all, we talked about, um, I think at the last meeting, uh, that the policy and, and regulation subcommittee would join with the attracting new business subcommittee with a single survey. And we've decided not to do that. So we're both, big, it just didn't work well. We just, we had too diverse uh, a group of people that we're trying to. Um, contact and we had very specific questions that we were looking for in terms of policy and regulation. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Ivan and Tom are working um, with the help of other members of the policy committee to come up with the final survey. I think we're really close to getting the final survey and uh, getting it in a, in a format that um, uh, is gonna be uh, workable and that we can uh, um, get usable answers from that. Um, uh, and um, Sally and Jeff have been working on that, um, that, well, I think it was 600 businesses, Sally, is that right? Something of that sort um, list that we had, that, but it wasn't quite up to date. They've been updating it and prioritizing which businesses to send um, a survey to. And Sally has been putting together uh, 
um, email addresses, which will facilitate getting getting that out there. I think that once we get that, we're aiming for um, a, an April um, launch of the survey. Um, and then I think once that goes out, we probably will also uh, request input from the general public on regulations and policies, uh, probably through the web, through the Woodstock Digest or something of that sort. I was thinking that we probably are going to contact a number of the people that Isabel wanted to contact, but we're not going to probably be as expeditious as she would need, and, and, it, and we would be hitting a lot of businesses that really weren't weren't applicable to that that idea that she has. But um, yeah, so that's where we're at. We're thinking we'll be able to come back with much better or more um, substantive answers um, next time. And the basic question you're asking in a, of all those people is basically, what are the policies that you think would it could help th that might need to be changed, or what are the barriers that, you know that we could make it uh, easier or for companies to grow or for companies to to come here or whatever? I mean, it's, and, and what are they like? The, you know, there's a there, there are a number of uh, um, restrictions, especially downtown, which um, I think a lot of the retailers actually like and feel like it, it's protecting protecting us. Yeah, also, I didn't mean to focus on the negative. Yeah. yeah. And then also on um, just in general, looking at things like, uh, which may not specifically affect them, like um, parking and use of the green and um, um, uh, that, that type of thing. Okay. Any, any um, questions, uh, Patrick? Would this be the group that would pr propose the idea of the, uh, Occupancy tax, the you know the, the having spaces that are uh, open, uh, and and penalizing them for that. Uh, we had discussions last month about that. Is that an idea that would be this group? I'm not sure where that would go. Yeah, I I, I guess someone could propose that as a new policy. You mean, or as a yeah. as a yeah, someone could propose that if if someone felt that was a good idea. Yeah, I, we're I don't know of anybody in our group that's backing that, but. I'd well, I, it's not, a, it was just, it was an idea that came up last month. I thought it was an interesting mm -hmm. idea to help, you know, keep the, the spaces full with somebody. Uh, I guess some of the discussion last month was that, you know, the businesses weren't necessary and the, the building owners weren't necessarily in a hurry to fill spaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Larry, and I think the question was whether or not, if I recall, I think the question is whether or not a vacancy tax, is it permissible? Uh, who else does it? How much is a tax? Is it something that would actually incentivize people to fill a building or is a vacancy tax just sort of a random inconvenience that doesn't actually go very far? It's, it's, more, it's more out of principle than anything else. Um, it might even actually help them. Because they're doing it for, for tax reasons and they help them actually. Right. Larry, I think from a process point of view, if, unless you object, this is, um, th th it would be good for the policy group to take as its agenda of potential issues to explore primarily what you hear from the surveys, mm -hmm. but also in addition, things that come up in these meetings. And you can decide what weight to give a different ideas. <laughs> and you may not be able to investigate all of them. But I think you should add to the list so that so that we don't just drop the ball on these. I think that if this is, I think this would be one issue that you should add to your list. And again, what what you do with it is up to you. Okay. If that's is that okay? And if there are other issues, that you should be on the lookout. If there are other issues in in these EDC meetings where issues get raised, you know, we add it to your list, and it may die there or it may come back. You know. Well, that was, I should say that was the other thing that uh, it seemed like we decided in that the group meeting that you called, John, which is that there are going to probably in every one of these subcommittees, there are going to be issues that are, have a, um, a, a policy or regulation element to them. Um, and when those come up, they can be sent, or, you know, addressed to us if they are major issues. Um, but if there's something like uh, that, you just have to call Neil and say, you know, is is there any reason we can't do such and such under current village or town um, um, regulations? You know, then we would ask to, to yeah. make that call rather than just every time there's a regulation or policy 
uh, thing. That, that doesn't, that, that is not um, the same thing as this vacancy tax. That's right. Over there. right. Okay, any other questions about any of the groups we've talked about? We've got one more I'll mention in a minute. No. Okay, um, attracting new businesses. I, again, I, <laughs> I'm not used to this new model, so I forgot to ask Stuart Matthews, who's heading downtown rejuvenation, or, or Laird, uh, 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 who's heading um, attracting new businesses. So um, roughly speaking, one of the main initiatives of the attracting new businesses group is to interview new business owners and new residents of Woodstock and basically ask them what attracted them here and ask them about the kind of businesses that they thought were important to get them here or that they wanted to create here or what they think is missing. And those are individual interviews. Stuart has recruited, he put a notice on the list or just one, I think, and he's got 29 people have responded being willing to be interviewed. And he's slowly started working his way through these individual interviews and he's keeping good track of the answers. So he'll be able to report back to that group what these folks are saying. Um, that's not the only group of people that, 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 that will, will turn to, to ask them about what types of businesses do you think Woodstock needs? But getting new people who've just moved here is, I think gets a unique lens on this question and they, they seem to be successful at, people seem to want to talk to them. So um, again, more to, more to come uh, with that. Any, uh, Devin, go ahead. Yeah, could you connect me with him? I, I uh, think he would be the right person to join a conversation with the Magnuson Center at Dartmouth. I, I met with them uh, briefly earlier in the week and they have a couple of resources that they're willing to connect us with to, uh, if, if we're interested in trying to attracting entrepreneurs from Hanover um, that are, you know, say from Tuck or, or, or graduating undergrads, um, they can help us do that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, who is, who is that, Devin? The, the Magnuson Center is the Entrepreneurial Center at Dartmouth. Yeah, fantastic. I forgot to ask you to follow up on that. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's Laird Bradley, um, but if you, uh, I'll send you his email address. Um, uh, but he's the broker. He's probably, which, what's it, which firm is he? Um, Williamson. Williamson. The Williamson Group. Williamson Group. So you can just look on the web, but it, it, Laird Bradley. I'll, I'll introduce the two of you via email. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, uh, I realize that you know what's happening now is as we kind of reorient ourselves, not entirely, but mostly around these working groups, it kind of feels like we're all getting started and there's not much happening and so forth. At least that's the way it feels to me. Th that's perfectly appropriate, it seems to me. You know, we're, we're, we're properly, I think, setting our sights on a set of bigger ideas the ideas are a bit messy. Some of the groups overlap. You know, some, Patrick, you asked, or someone asked maybe Patrick, well, where does this one fit? And, you know, that's all fine. It's, it's, it, it's just the natural way that, that this is going to work. And I, we just have to give this time. And I think it's starting up the way I imagined it would. And, you know, a year from now, we're going to be making progress on five out of six of these groups. And uh, it, it takes a long time to have a real impact. So um, don't get, we shouldn't be discouraged. I'm not at all. I think we're organized to do important things here. And we still have capacity to do other new things like this transportation idea or other ideas that may come up from time to time. So, Okay, the last thing. Um, John, John, just in light of that, I, what I'm on the Attracting New Business Committee too, and we're doing quite a bit more than just that, uh, that just survey that Stuart's doing. We, Please we go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I should have asked you. Well, I, I don't want to go because there's lots of things. I, what, what brought that up in my mind was um, one on our list was to contact Tuck, and this Magnuson Center sounds like a much better, more direct thing. But we've um, we've been we've got uh, uh, we've drawn on that Williams Group survey for what has been other other um, uh, towns have done that have been successful in attracting new business. We've talked a lot of there's a lot more going on. So it, it just in terms of progress, we we're doing a lot more than just the survey. Just yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And apologies for if I've shortchanged that no, group no, no, or any no, other just, group. I, 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 yeah. I just mean that it's, you know, it used to be like we're giving out grants every meeting and now what we're doing is, is setting up and, and starting to work on these issues. And I just think that that's normal. So I don't want anyone to be discouraged by that. And that's great. Okay. Um, last is um, at the other end of the pipeline, nearing the end, very close to the end is um, Teagle's Landing Project. And I don't know if Beth or Joe want to give a quick update on a lot has happened. Yeah, a lot has happened. Um, we're uh, moving 
moving right along, uh, the uh, the permit process has been completed successfully. I'm happy to say, um, the church, the um, Christian Science Church, has been notified, you know, of the schedule, and uh, they will remove the display case in order for the work to be done, um, and then it's going to go to um, Sai, and he is. Uh, going to provide a platform from them. I guess they're going to refurbish it to a certain degree. They're going to paint it and put a new roof on it and then uh, reinstall it where Sai puts the new platform. Uh, I've I bought two tables, two six foot 50 tables. And uh, right now they're in the barn behind the cafe. I, I plan to um, sand them down and uh, stain them and put some weather protections on it. Uh, if I have time, I'll reassemble them. If not, I said, Sai, you can have the honor, and he, he couldn't thank me enough uh, for allowing him to assemble them. Um, we have the issue of watering. Uh, there's a clause in the contract that the plants will be guaranteed for a year as long as the, the watering and the maintain, maintenance of those specific plants that are planted is consistent with what Sai identified as a proper process. So um, I plan to attend a trustee meeting on the 13th and explain that to the trustees um, and indicate that we are doing this to satisfy the clause in the contract we have with Sai, and is not to be interpreted as that we will assume responsibility for the constant maintenance of Teagle's Landing. So uh, that'll happen on the 13th. Beth is working on getting us a new trash can. Um, it, it's one of the trash cans. When we were going through the trash, the trash can debate many, many months ago, it's one of those that everybody liked and approved of. Uh, John and I had a quick discussion about it. And um, since uh, there probably won't be as much traffic down there there is at, on the green, uh, it was decided that the trash can, the one trash can with one side is trash and the other side is recycled would just do a good job and suffice. So that's what we're pursuing right now. Um, I spoke inside this morning. He's delighted and happy to engage in this project, and he plans on starting the week of April 12th. That's week after next. It should take about, oh, 10 days or so for completion, and I'm sure he'll do a terrific job. So um, that's about it. If anybody like to ask any questions, I'd be happy. Well done. Yeah, congratulations. It's very exciting. Um, I have I have one just one quick question, Joe. The, the yeah. um yeah oh Bill uh, it was for Bill Corson, but he just sent a message saying he was stepping off. Is there any indication that the village trustees will take responsibility for the first year watering? Well, you know, you know, John, that's an excellent question. It really is, and my personal feeling is. They should. I mean, that is town property. I know, I know, I know. And I, I you know, we can all agree that uh, Teagle's Landing, as it exists right now, is in really bad shape. And, you know, and with all due respect, I may suggest that one of the reasons why is because the village hasn't taken the responsibility that it should in maintaining it over the years. Now, yeah, I, I know we're going to get into that, but um, it's, it's just, I spoke with Bill Kerbin about it. I spoke with Jeff Kahn about it. They both agree that, you no, know, the village should maintain that. It's a question of, you know, them putting it on the schedule with every other property that the village owns and maintains. And, uh, I plan on making that point, um, at, at the meeting on the 13th. 
Bill, do you, Bill Kerbin just turned his video back on. Do you want to comment on this? I mean, how, we, we, maybe, I mean, I don't mean to make this like a negotiation, but the, we lose our leverage when we yeah. start construction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, one thing I want to say is I know, you know, we, we've had this ongoing discussion now with the select board um, and Ray's on the, on the call too, about having uh, some sort of parks manager. Now, the issue here is that we don't have that in the budget for this year, but I think maybe we need to have a, uh, a broader discussion with maybe you, John, and, and Joe on this too, and Mary. Um, so I don't think she's on tonight, but I no, think- No, Mary couldn't make it tonight. Yeah. So I think, I think that's something that we probably need to do. In fact, we're meeting with Mary McVeigh in May about this as well with East End Park. So uh, not to make this too convoluted or too disjointed, but I think- I, 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 think, I, I, think, I think it'd be a mistake not to progress, you know, with this project without a clear understanding from the trustees, you know, where the responsibilities are. I, I think it's a real mistake to depend as they have on the past on volunteers at the garden club and other volunteers that did it when they can and if they can and to the, to the degree that they had the ability to do it. So, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of money into this. We're hiring the best contractor in the area. We're using the best materials. I mean, that should be obvious to them that from then on, you know, the ball's in your court. You, it's up to you to get it maintained. I, that's my opinion anyway. I, I, I guess, Patrick. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because there's a lot of areas in, in Woodstock that are being uh, gentrified for lack of a better word. Uh, that I think the town has kind of just let go in the past. And it's definitely something that needs to be discussed uh, on, on who, who maintains this. And I mean, if it's town property, it seems to me the logical thing would be for the town to take care of it. So, I, you know, I, I think it's, if we want to keep Woodstock moving forward and, and gentrifying and beautifying things, then this definitely needs to be figured out soon. I agree. I guess the question is what happens? I mean, I, I, I hate to be in a kind of a cover our ass mode, yeah. but, but just momentarily, what happens if Cy does the work the week of the 12th and on the 13th, the, the village trustees say, well, you know, we agree, but we don't have it in the budget this year. And, you know, we had, there's some, you know, we have to, the water pipe broke in front of, you know, Nick's store and we have to fix that. And what, what do yeah, we do? Well, you know, John, the only way I can, answer, I can address that is, this shouldn't be a surprise to them on the 13th. You know, we, we've had this discussion for quite a while. And for them, I, I think it would have been, well, you know, I, I can only speak from my own seat. But for them to say, oh, wow, we didn't plan on this. Well, you know, I can, I, again, I think I talked to Bill last summer about it. I know I talked to Jeff last summer about it. So it shouldn't come as a, a big shock. Oh, you really want us to take care of this thing? Um, yeah. Yeah. Ray? Ray, do you have your hand up? Yeah, okay, go. I did. Um, you know, I, I got to tell you, and in and, and all due respect to Cy and everybody else, um, I've been in this business all my life, and I never had a contractor say that I'll warranty it if somebody else maintains it because it's just – it's going to be a problem at the end of the contract. If something dies, it's going to be a finger pointing situation. Um, I, I, I've never heard of this in my life. Well, have, that, 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 Ray, that's if, if, if sorry for interrupting, but um, that's something that John and I discussed where the EDC, if need be, will provide extra funds to make sure that what he plants gets maintained to satisfy that warranty in the contract. So, and the maintenance will be under direction of Cy. He's gonna say, this is where I want, and this is what I want water and when and how and all, you know, all the direction is gonna be from Cy. So I think that base is pretty much covered. I think what we're talking about is the ongoing maintenance of this thing from there on. The on right now, Joe, in, in, in the 
I don't know what's if it's different up here or not, but when I did construction and when I had people do construction for me, they would main they were they were required to maintain a plant material for and it was a 10% holdback on the contract until everything was approved. 90 now it's 90 days, it used to be a year. Well, so, my question is to maintain it for how long, right? They were required to maintain the plant material in perpetuity or, or when? Just with, for the main, for the warranty. Yeah, and that's and that's what we have. No, no, but you're asking you're having a village maintain it for the warranty. No, 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 I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe you misunderstood. I, okay. And I'm sorry if I didn't articulate it properly. We're asking the village to maintain. We will. We will. Um, ensure the proper maintenance of the planting that's going in, but not forever until the contract is satisfied. And I think it's for one year. No, no. Right. And from there on, the village has to take it. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. The town should be maintained and may be responsible for it. Wait, now, wait, who's, Beth, I know you're raising your hand, but I, sorry to <laughs> dive into the details here, but I think this is the only issue that's important that's left. Uh, when you say we will maintain it for a year, is the we Psi or the we is the EDC? The we is EDC. Well, yeah. I think what Ray is saying is, is that in, he's never seen a contract where someone other than Psi waters the plants for 90 days or one year. Right. Uh, it, you it, know, he, we, I talked about that with Psi. Yeah. He said, yeah, I'll do it, but it's going to cost, and I'm going to have to probably buy a pump to pump the water out of the brook or find some way of getting one of it, you know, I, I'm sure if that's what we want, we can do that. I mean, we, we somebody is going to have to maintain it and somebody's going to get paid for it. Okay, well, now, let's... I'm sure Cy would do it if he's going to get paid for it, or we have to hire somebody else to do it under Cy's direction. Yeah, okay. Either way, Cy is going to be there making sure that it's done and done right. Beth? Well, what I, I just wanted to say, because I have the contract here, and it has been signed by the town, authorized, you know, by the EDC, and Bill signed it that said, all landscape pricings are installed costs, follow-up watering can be provided, all plant materials have a one-year guarantee given proper watering, and follow-up care as care direction right. as follows. Okay. So it it is, it is really up. It, it, it's up to us to pay for it. Okay, could exactly. we could we get a proposal, Joe, from from? Uh, sorry, Mika, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. I am so sorry, but I'm I'm actually thoroughly confused now. So who? So Joe, just can you just clarify? I'm sorry, but so Sai is going to do. He'll do the watering for the first year, and we'll pay him. Or wait, what's happening? Currently, go ahead, Jeff. All right, all right, I'll explain it. The contract says that he guarantees the plantings for one year as yeah. long as they're proper, properly maintained. Now, right. and we're talking about just the planting. That doesn't mean going down there and cleaning up the grounds and all that sort of stuff. That's going to be the village. He's talking about just the planting. Now, we can either pay side to do it or we can pay somebody else to do it. Okay, could, let's get a proposal from Cy to see how much it would cost for him to do it. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Okay, all right. So it just hasn't been arranged yet, is what it really is. We just haven't figured out who that person is yet, right? That's exactly right. Gotcha, okay, sorry about that, thank you. All right, and we have a little bit of money left in the budget because of the um, clever purchasing of the picnic tables. <laughs> <laughs> so. John. Now there's one other issue. Now, uh, a deposit is gonna have to be sent to side. And the amount is $11,271. It's 15% of the total cost. So at some point, uh, we have to get that out of the budget and get over to the side. That's fine, Sally, can, this is an approved project unless you disagree. Oh no, Sally, we don't do, we don't do deposits. We are a reimbursement program. So all of our grants are done on reimbursement only. 
So if this is something that we need to send a deposit before any work has been done, I mean, I guess if we have a contract, maybe that's okay. If well, we, a, we are the grant, we no. are the grantee, the, this, this the grantee this, pays for it, right? Right, typically the grantee pays for it. But we are the grantee. <laughs> well, I don't know, Bill, we can walk, we can talk about this because if you have a signed contract and it asks for the 15%, then that will do it, but it has to be a part of the contract, I believe. It is. It is part of the contract, so. Beth, you, okay. I have not seen the contract. I don't think okay. we do have it. I can send it to you tomorrow, Sally. Okay, that should be okay then. But that's I'm just to remind people that's typically how we we do payments are only our reimbursement for our grantees. So we don't typically pay for things up front unless there is a contract. Okay, so hopefully what, we, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a hold of Cy tomorrow and ask him to submit a proposal of what it would cost to maintain the uh, the plantings uh, so that it's covered in the contract. I, I, I think Joe, yeah, I think by April twelfth, if he's gonna start on April twelfth, I think we ought to have a plan for watering the plants for one year by April twelfth. If it's not, sure. if it's Cy, that's great. If it's not Cy then we'll have to reach out to the community and, and figure out who can who can do it. But it shouldn't be hard, as you point out. It shouldn't be hard to get it. But let's have a plan in place. Okay. So that we, okay. you know, and, and yeah. And we'll talk about the budget implications of that. I'm hoping that it fits into that. I think we still have a bit of, I think we have a bit of, We yeah. do. Yeah, okay. We, we definitely do. Let's, I mean, that's the same. Okay. All right, good. Any other, uh, are there any, so anything else on Teagle's Landing? Any other comments, Patrick? So just to, so that I understand what, what's doing. So I was gonna give a bid for doing it for a year and then the town is gonna take it over after that. You know, cause that, that needs to be a discussion had. And then in the meantime, he's only gonna do the watering. Who's gonna do the, the regular maintenance? Uh, those are questions that still need to be answered. Correct. I think, and I think the question is what I was suggesting is that if we have uh, what I was implying, and I'll make it explicit, is that if we have an agreement to water the plants, that we go ahead with the construction, and that we 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 we're having a discussion one day later with the village. Who by I mean, there's no argument that the village should be doing this, or whether it's the town or the village. I mean, it's the village-owned property. That this is a municipal property. They should be doing it. In the worst possible case the infrastructure that we pay for will remain robust because we're watering the plants and everything else is physical. And if it turns out to be a mess, then, you know, and it's not raked or cleaned up, then, you know, I, we'll have to deal with that, but it won't be a loss of funding or, you know, we won't be in a, in a difficult financial place. It'll just be a finger pointing exercise, which we'll have to deal with. Um, so I think that's why I think it's, you know, I don't think we should hold up the construction until we get an agreement with the town maintenance or the village maintenance. I, I think maybe that'll take a month to work out if, as they think about how to budget for it or whatever. But as long as the plants don't die and the, mar the uh, granite steps aren't going to decay, then I think we'll be okay. If, if the EDC disagrees, now's the time to say so and we can hold off. But well, and, and if, if we watered for a year, then it, we don't need to worry about whether the budget in the town's uh, or in the village's budget because we're taking care of that for a year. Exactly. They, they, their budget excuse goes away because they have a year to plan for it. Right. Got it. Okay, cool. But and that is, in the, just, to, just to clarify, that, that, is our, that was kind of the discussion we had in the budget um, discussions this fall, but that kind of got shifted. So we're, we'll definitely be looking at this, this budget cycle. So right. Thanks, I'll Bill. keep that front and center. Yeah. But in the meantime, as as we expressed earlier, we're gonna ask Cy to submit a proposal what it would cost for him to maintain the plants, the plants, the plants for a year. Right. The village has to maintain the rest of it in terms of picking up trash, uh, raking extra leaves, whatever it takes to make that place look good and stay looking good. Right. The village has that responsibility. What we're gonna, what we're gonna consign with Cy is watering and maintaining those plants 
so they stay healthy for that first year. Yeah, exactly. And that's our, that protects our capital investment. Ray, does that make sense given your experience? I think it does. I think that's what you're suggesting. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think you should just have side water it. That way if anything dies, there's no one, there's no finger pointing. Yeah. Right. I couldn't agree with you more, Ray. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah. It may have been, uh, yeah, it may have been my suggestion to not do that. So I apologize ah. Joe, if I have set you around in circles here, but okay, good. Any other, um, anything else on Teagle's Landing or anything else? Let me just ask Michael, sorry, I know Michael Malik is in a car and maybe he had, Michael, is there anything you want to add if you, you're muted right now, but I know it's hard for you to kind of chime in. Any comments you want to make? You don't have to, but. Um, you know, I mean, my question is like, what is it? What is maintaining the plants? I mean, is it just watering? Are we talking about weeding? Are we? Is it mulching? I mean, like, I don't, I don't know what the scope of that is. I think it's keeping them alive, but I'm not an expert. Exactly right. That's it. Keeping them alive. So I assume that's just watering. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that is whatever is required to keep them alive. So is it Water. even possible then, Joe? to have a uh, automated sprinkler system? I mean, I, again, I haven't looked at the landscaping layout, but can we do something like that? Those are pretty common these days. An, autom an automatic sprinkler system. Not necessarily a sprinkler system, but even just an automatic, you know, you can have like a hose or whatever that's on a timer and it can water multiple times a day. And those are pretty well, inexpensive. Then, I, wait a minute, you asked me the question. Go and then make it. <laughs> I would, if, if, you, if you think about that, it's going to require water. So what you're suggesting is a permanent hookup to some source of water, which there is not in that area. The garden club has to haul water to do the plants that are on top of the bridge. Unless, of course, we buy a pump and we stick it in the spring, but then you're going to have electricity to turn it on and off. And there isn't that over there either. So I think the best way to do it, since Cy is an expert and he's the best contractor in the area, leave it up to Cy to make sure that they stay healthy for the first year. Mika? Well, I think beyond, beyond that, um, or in addition to that, it's more than just watering. You know, these plants are new. They're, they're new plantings. They, they require a little bit of extra care. And it, it's not something where you just want to put them on an automatic watering cycle and hope that they stay alive. You need to check the moisture level. You need to see what kind of, you know, bugs are there. Is there disease that you need to deal with? Is there, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it than just watering. So I think to protect the investment and all the hard work that this group has done to put that in, I think it would make sense to just go forward with Cy, let him take care of it, pay him whatever we need to do to make that happen and make sure that that investment stays protected. Yeah. And I think getting a place to find out who is going to cover that after Sai is not covering it anymore is also critical because yeah. otherwise it's all work done for naught. No, and Joe, is that's what the meeting on the 13th is all about. Right, right. Okay. All right, very good. Okay, I think, is there any other, any other business or any other comments going once? Nope. Okay, all right. Thanks, Teagle's Landing team. This is very exciting. Before our next meeting, it should be done, assuming this yeah, all works out. Yeah, we well, okay. can have our next meeting there, maybe. Six, <laughs> six, uh, thanks, everybody. See you next month. Hey, we have the motion to adjourn, right? Oh, sorry, that's right. Yes. Could I have a motion to adjourn, Patrick? Is there a second? Second. Joe, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, 721. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>